Arguably, it can be said that there is new, no other United States senator or congressman who has a better global perspective than Bill Nelson. In 1986, he spent six days orbiting the Earth aboard the space shuttle Columbia. Nearly three decades later, he still viv vividly recalls looking at our planet from the window of the space shuttle and not seeing any political, religious, or racial divides. Bill Nelson likes to say that we are all in this together, and if politicians and world leaders would remember that, we'd all get a lot more done. It is that perspective that has earned him a reputation as a reasonable voice in an increasingly partisan political world. He began his political career in 1972 with election to the Florida House of Representatives. After serving three terms, he was elected to the United States Congress in 1978, serving six terms representing Orlando and the Space Coast. In 1994, he was elected to Florida cabinet, serving as state treasurer, insurance commissioner, and fire marshal. He was elected to the United States Senate in the year 2000 and has served there ever since. Please join me in now welcoming him for the 10th time to the Forum Club, Senator Bill Nelson. Thank you, Senator. Good to have you. Thank you, Ed. When uh, all of the candidates were introduced, I couldn't help but have that flashback to that first campaign, uh, Grace and I had just come home from our honeymoon and a seat opened in the Florida legislature and we started going door to door. In a small district, if you wear out shoe leather, it can make a difference. Uh, even in these tumultuous times, it can make a difference. Well, it didn't take me too long to realize that I was wasting Grace's time as she was standing there at the door that we would knock on uh, because she was a natural. So I put Grace on the other side of the street and we'd go opposite sides down the street knocking on doors. And she had this messianic attitude that when she approached the door of a home, she was going to get the votes in that home for her husband. But one day she comes to a home, she can't get to the front door because the sprinklers are on, but the garage door is open. <laughs> so she marches into the garage, into the back inside door and rings the doorbell, only it's not the doorbell, it's the automatic garage door closer. <laughs> Now, this is a long time ago, and the lights didn't have to come on when the garage door shut, and so she's in this dark garage thinking, what am I going to do? She says, well, if I can just make my way back over to that door, maybe somebody's home. Of course, in the process, in the dark, she's encountering the bicycles and the lawnmower. She gets there, and she pounds on the door just hoping somebody's there, and sure enough, the gentleman of the house is there. He opens the door. There's Grace in his dark garage. She doesn't know what to say. She says, sir, will you vote for my husband? <laughs> and that's how our political career started. And those were good days. And I want to digress one other minute. You mentioned the, the great privilege that I have and I have had of being involved in the space program. Uh, we have here today one of the true American heroes, and I want you to meet him along with his wife, Pandora, the very first shuttle, space shuttle STS-1 pilot, Bob Crippen. Bob, would you stand up and take a bow? <clears throat> Bob was on that first flight. Uh, it is now 35 years ago. I had landed on the desert in uh, Edwards Air Force Base, launched from here. Uh, it was the first time that a spacecraft had been flown that had humans on it that we had not test flown it before. 
And so it was John Young in the left seat and Bob in the right seat, only a two-person crew. Uh, and, of course, the rest is history. Uh, and Bob went on to command several flights later over the course of his career, including doing just incredible stuff in uh, the Hubble Space Telescope that we put up that had a defective lens and they had to go back and correct it. Anyway, that's due to these kind of folks with the right stuff. Now, I want to reflect back on politics. It was a stark contrast for me as I looked out the window of that spacecraft uh, back 30 years ago because what struck me as a politician as I looked at this beautiful, colorful creation suspended in the middle of nothing and space is nothing and there's home and it's the planet and when you look you don't see the political division. You don't see the religious division. You don't see the ethnic division. All of these things that bedevil us on the face of the earth. And yet they do. And the politics in America today have become so sharp and shrill, so excessive, almost, uh, in some cases, blood sport, although when you think back to the early founding of the country, I mean, a Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson used to go after it. The election of 1800 of uh, Thomas Jefferson, when John Adams was trying to get a second term, I mean, they went after it. But communication was slow, and there was time for thought and there was time for reflection, and there was time for reading. And there was also courtliness, gentlemanliness, although they did settle some grievances with a duel. Fast forward to today, and what you see is an increasing balkanization of our politics an increasing uh, running of special interest groups. Need I say anything about the position of outside money that comes in and these undeclared social purpose organizations that don't have anything to do with social purposes, and yet the contributions don't have to be disclosed, so you don't know who is contributing to influence the election, which is what the campaign law is all about. That's the direction it's going. It's become a lot more partisan. When I was first running statewide for treasurer insurance commissioner and then elected to the Senate, there was a middle ground of about 10% that if you really tried to get your message out and you had enough money, even in a big state like Florida, that you could get on the TV, that you could influence that middle ground and hopefully rebut some of the arguments that were being made against you and in some cases the untruths that were being tell told about you. And generally that middle area of 8 to 10 percent, which included some Democrats, some Republicans, and independents, and that was the swing in a big state like Florida that was basically a fairly even state, 8 to 10 percent. That has narrowed to 2 to 3 percent today because what's happened is that people have retreated to their partisan base. And it's harder to influence that particular swing group in order to get elected. And yet, it is what it is. 
you see the influence not only of money, but of 5-4 decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, that allows the money to come in in these outside groups. We cannot get the IRS to change a rule that it actually changed the meaning 30 years ago of a statute that said those 501c4 organizations were in fact for a social purpose, not a political purpose. But we can't get the IRS to change that. They're too scared because of the buffeting of the political extremes. Likewise, the Federal Communications Commission. You, as a receiver of people using the public's airways, are supposed to be able to know the content who it's paid for. And yet, interpretations in the FCC, aided and abetted by this Supreme Court decisions, have turned this all upside down. And so what we have today, and it is what it is, you see it, we have an age of celebrity, we have an age of excessive politics, all in rapid fire communication, instant communication, and increasingly it's difficult to find the middle ground. So take, for example, what's happening in Washington right now. By October the 1st, we have to come up with a whole new set of appropriations bills. And yet, one side is insisting that we have this across-the-board cut called a sequester unrelated to the actual substance of a program across the board cut that will end up devastating programs. This started three years ago. But because a Democrat from the Senate and a Republican from the House got together on the overall blueprint of the budget, they hammered out and lessened that sequester cut across the board for the last two fiscal years of which that last one is ending right now come September the 30th. And if we can't get people to relent from across the board, this is affecting everything. Huge cuts, defense. I don't think you all would support those cuts in defense. NIH, I don't think that you would support those cuts. Three years ago, when the first cut went in, Dr. Francis Collins, the head of NIH, the guy who, by the way, uh, unlocked the secrets of the human genome, he had to cancel 700 medical experiment grants to universities and research institutions like Scripps because of that sequester cut. Now, think cut for a whole year until we partially restored those the next year. Think about that medical research. And so I could go through every part of government, the Coast Guard. We have an inbound tropical storm. It looks like it's uh, a little less going to be an effect on us. Uh, it's now drawing a bead on Naples, not the East Coast, still as a tropical storm. But, you know, Florida is Hurricane Highway sticking down uh, in the middle uh, of where the hurricanes come. We've been spoiled for 10 years. We don't have it. What about the cuts to FEMA? What about the cuts to the Coast Guard? What about the cuts of Homeland Security grants that go to that EOC, that Emergency Operations Center, which, by the way, is one of the best I've ever seen when I went there this morning. 
and you could go through all the parts of government. This is not a way to run a railroad, and yet it is the politics. Now, there's an easy way to solve this other than getting bipartisan support, but you've got to get to a middle ground to find that. There's a place that we could get a lot of revenue, and every one of you in this audience would support it, and that is reform of the Internal Revenue Tax Code. There's a lot of underbrush there. There's a underbrush, tax loopholes, things that are no longer relevant, the oil industry. There's still an incentive there, a tax loophole for the oil industry to have an incentive to drill. That's almost a century old. You don't need those. You could get huge amounts of revenue if you could eliminate a lot of those tax loopholes. You could even take that money. You could lower everybody's tax rate, both individual and corporate, and if some of the opposition would allow, then you'd have new revenue left over that you could use to fill the whole of the sequester of these across-the-board cuts. But this is what we're facing. And sadly, what you are going to look, since I am the kickoff speaker of a new season, as you get down the road and it gets just past October the 1st, you may be looking at kicking the can down the road again another so-called continuing resolution, which is just keeping all the appropriations bills in place going forward. But you may see, as we get toward late October, when the artificial statutory debt ceiling has to be raised for the government to be able to borrow in order to pay its bills, you may see the attempt to shut down not only the government with no appropriations, but a refusing of rising the debt ceiling, which would cause the United States government to default on its financial obligations. Now, this is serious business, but this is what is happening. And so, whether you are interested in having appropriate air traffic control and safety through the FAA, whether you want to fix some of these crumbling roads and bridges. And by the way, that, there's a good, good example, a success story, the highway bill. A very conservative Republican chairman, Jen Inhofe from Oklahoma, a very liberal top Democrat on that committee, Barbara Boxer from California. The two of them worked together and they produced a highway bill. But the question is now, how are we going to fund the highway bill? Because the needs of the roads and bridges far exceed now what the gas tax produces since people are buying less gas and since that gas tax was set 20 years ago and has not been adjusted for inflation. That's what we're facing. All right, I know uh, you're getting fidgety and I just want to uh, address one other topic. One of the most important decisions that I will cast will be cast in uh, a vote in just a few weeks. And that is the question about the Iran nuclear agreement. I will vote for the Iran nuclear agreement and I want to tell you I want to tell you why. Because people of goodwill can come down on different sides of this issue. One of my best friends in the Senate is Chuck Schumer. Chuck has come out on the other side of this issue. He respects my position and I respect him. Uh, as of two days ago, 29 Democrats in the Senate had come out. 
there are three leaning yes. That brings to a total of 32. And you need 34 to sustain in the Senate the, the president's veto. But if 41 Democrats vote for the deal out of only 46 Democrats in the Senate, then the measure does not proceed because you cannot get cloture on the motion to proceed to the bill. That will be one of the first critical votes. Now, what about the substance? Well, I come down very clearly in my mind on the fact that the best protection for the United States and our friends, our allies, especially Israel, is to have an Iran without a nuclear weapon. The whole purpose of the negotiations in the first place was to make an Iran without a nuclear weapon. Now, we know back in the 90s and in the 2000s, they were starting to think about a militarized nuclear program. They stopped. And then they started up again in the late first decade of this century uh, to the point at which the interim agreement was set. It scaled back their efforts, and now in front of us is the ability to have a unnuclear weapon Iran and to do so for at least 10, if not 15 years. Right now, if we walk away from the agreement, Iran can develop a nuclear weapon in two to three months. If we agree to this agreement, which has its flaws, at the very least, they will not produce a nuclear weapon until after 10 years and probably after 15 years. All the safeguards are in place, and I could tell you that if you want to follow up with questions on this, I can give you all of those details. Now, what happens if they cheat? If they cheat, the question is, do we have the inspections in place? For the established sites, Iraq, Natanz, and Fordo, there is immediate and unannounced inspections, contrary to what you've heard. So what happens if they do a covert site? At the very least, the inspectors could be held off for 24 days. So could they hide it? If they're developing a nuclear detonator, yes, they could hide it. But to get to a bomb, you've got to enrich uranium or plutonium, and you can't hide that. The half-life of uranium is thousands of years. You cannot paint over it. You can't asphalt over it. We would find it. And on top of that, you put our very substantial, along with Israel, intelligence apparatus, and we would know. And then everything is available to us if they cheated. That is available to us now. The continuation of the sanctions, putting them back in place, which we would have the support of the P5 plus ones, that's the European countries, including China and Russia. But if we walked away now from the agreement, all of those sanctions would disappear. And that $56 billion net, which is Iranian oil money in five countries' foreign banks, that would end up in their hands and the economic sanctions would collapse. So when I put all this together, I don't have the opportunity to change the agreement. I know that Iran is going to continue to be aggressive and say hateful things and do things to all of ours and our allies, Israel especially, 
interest, but that's not my vote. My vote is either yay or nay. And I think it is in the interest of the United States and our allies going forward that we deal with an Iran that does not have a nuclear weapon. Now, let me just stop there because I've probably gone over time and let me take your questions, please. Well, let's start with uh, the students. They have the first two questions. Uh, the students from Florida Atlantic University will start. Hello, my name is Paola Hernandez Ramos. I'm a graduate student of political science at FAU. Thank you very much for answering my question. And it follows, what kind of research do you do, you do when deciding to support or oppose the agreement like the one with Iran? Uh, clarify the question. The question is, what research? Yes. OK, uh, are you talking about the ability of us to detect them? Are you talking about uh, why in the development of a nuclear weapon that we would know if they were doing that uh, all the way from the uranium mines through the processing? W what are you referring to? I'm talking about your personal support or opposition to the agreement. Okay, well, I, I think I've just given you a summary. So if you want to dig into... Uh, dig in into the details, as you mentioned. Okay. All right, uh, take, for example, what I just said. We will have the ability going forward to make sure that they don't develop a nuclear weapon uh, because from cradle to grave, we have on-site inspectors in their minds in all of the processing going to yellow cake, then to all of these 19,000 uh, centrifuges, which under the agreement go down in 19,000 centrifuges, some of which are generation four, all have to be lessened to 6,000 centrifuges, generation one with inspectors right there. Uh, so at every step of the process, we will know if they're trying to develop a nuclear weapon. And if they tried that, and we know it, and our scientists, uh, particularly the Secretary of Energy, who is a Nobel laureate in nuclear physics, tells us that the minimum lead time, if they started to develop a nuclear weapon, that we would know the minimum is a year. So everything that's available to us now, we would be able then, if it's going to be a military strike, if it's going to be uh, including the snapback of the sanctions, which would include France, UK, uh, Germany, China, and Russia. Uh, by the way, you hear on television, $100 billion is going to go to Iran. First of all, understand that that's Iran's money. That's from their oil. But it's been ensconced in those five countries' banks. What are the countries? Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan, and there's one more. I think it might be Russia. OK. It's not $100 billion that's going to Iran. It's $56 billion because there are existing contracts that have to be paid by that $100 billion Iranian oil money in those banks. The net, indeed, $56 billion. Over time, after they've gone, not when we vote for the agreement, only when the IAEA has certified several things, which will be well into next year, would the money start to be distributed. 
if we walked away from this agreement, do you think the banks in China are going to keep Iran's money when they desperately want to buy Iran's oil and Iran at that point, if we walked away, is going to start discounting their oil? That money's going to get to them. The way you get those sanctions to come back into place is if the world community knows that, in fact, Iran has cheated and therefore the world community together has the reason, the P5 plus one and the rest of the world uh, that is with us now that would not be with us if, and their ambassadors have told us directly, directly to me that they would not support the sanctions continuing if we walk away from the deal. And that includes the ambassador from China, that includes the ambassador from Russia, which has been part of the joint agreement. Remember, this is a joint agreement. So those are some of the details, and Thank there you. are a lot, lot more. And from the Dreyfus School of the Arts. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Salinger, and we're all students from the Advanced Placement Government class at Dreyfus School of the Arts. We would just like to say thank you to the Forum Club for inviting us today as we celebrate our school's 25th anniversary. The question that we have for you today is, what advice could you provide high school seniors at, that you would have wished had been provided to you when you were 17 years old? May I give you uh, a flashback as I was uh, in the emergency operations center this morning and uh, we're talking about the effects of this tropical storm becoming a hurricane and, and I said, the press asked me a question, well, what should we do to get prepared? And I said, well, understand that hurricanes are typically a part of our lifestyle in Florida. I said, but we've been lulled to sleep for the last uh, 10 years. We haven't had one, but they're coming. And sometimes they're big monsters like Category 5, Hurricane Andrew in 1992. And I said, but that's interesting. You know, for me to answer this question as a Florida native, I grew up in Florida. It's a part of our lifestyle. Indeed, when I was a kid, Hurricanes were an, an excuse to get out of school. When I became a bachelor, hurricanes were an excuse to have a party. Now, with my more sobered reason judgment of years of experience, they're deadly serious. Uh, I was very fortunate, as you guys are over there in that magnet school, to have had as a 17-year-old kid, the great experience of good teachers who cared, of uh, people who generally got along. Uh, and I grew up in the shadow of the Cape, Melbourne High School. Uh, it was an exciting time. The people like Bob Crippen were just coming along. The original seven had been named. We were behind the Soviets. We were trying to catch up. And it was an exciting time. A lot of the scientists and the engineers at the Cape, their children went to school. I was very fortunate. And interestingly, my real love was public service. I always wanted to give back to my community and my country. And so if that is your passion, my advice to you in answer to your question is follow your passion. I might say that uh, our college interns, we take a lot of time with them. We pay a lot of attention to our interns. And what I have the interns years later stop me and say, we want you to know that the experience of working in your office on Capitol Hill gave us an appreciation for public service that indeed 
we have followed through in later life. And so that's what I'd say to you as my advice. Follow your passion. Thank you, students. Senator, we have a few questions from the floor. We have a good mix of political and policy questions. So let's start with this. Can you talk to us a little bit about the future possibility of oil drilling in the Everglades or offshore Florida? Uh, there is a group down here that wants to drill right off of uh, western Broward County. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen because of folks like you. Now, over on the western part of the state, there has been limited oil drilling over there for over a half a century. But there's not much oil in there. Some of it's in the big Cypress Preserve. Uh, and constantly what you find is examples that just completely torqued up the county commission of Collier County, Naples, uh, because this oil company that had gotten a, a permit to drill suddenly was drilling with a fracking material. And of course, fracking in North Dakota is one thing where there is shale rock. Fracking in Florida, which is nothing but porous limestone, is a totally different thing. And uh, finally, you know, I was one of the voices that was just trying to give them the business uh, down the country, as we say. But it took the Collier County Commission, uh, totally Republican, to say to the government in Tallahassee, you guys have got to stop this, and that fracking got stopped. Now, the question is off the East Coast and the West Coast. I got into this as a young congressman. There was a Secretary of the Interior named James Watt, and he was hell-bent that he was going to drill from North Carolina down to Fort Pierce, Florida. And I took him on. And I beat it in the appropriations bill. And my trump card, by the way, there's an interesting word. <laughs> uh, the ace card that I had <laughs> was that I said, on the east coast of Florida, you can't be drilling where we're launching all of our rockets that are putting our national security payloads and dropping the first stages and where we're doing our testing in the eastern test range. And back then, it was right about the time that Bob was flying on the space shuttle. And where we're dropping the solid rocket boosters from the space shuttle, you can't. they got the message. All right, same thing's happening out in the Gulf. If you've been reading the Palm Beach Post, they've actually covered that there's a Louisiana congressman when Mel Martinez and I, in 2006, a Republican senator and me jointly put off limits the Gulf of Mexico off Florida in law. It's the only place in the outer continental shelf of the United States that's off law to drilling. Why? First of all, there's not much oil out there. Secondly, look at our economy. It's built on tourism. When the BP spill came, that was way over in Louisiana. But the oil got as far as Pensacola Beach and Destin. And lo and behold, when people saw those sugary white beaches covered up black for a whole season, our guest tourists did not come. That's the second reason. But the third reason in the Gulf, it's not going to happen as long as I'm around. <laughs> the third reason is, do you know that the Gulf of Mexico off of Florida is the largest testing and training area for the United States military in the world? Why do you think we have the robust bases of Eglin Air Force Base and Tyndall Air Force Base and Key West Naval Air, Air Station? Because they've got unlimited 300 miles of being able not only to train pilots, 
but also to test some of our most sophisticated weapons that go hundreds and hundreds of miles. You cannot have oil rigs down there if you are doing that kind of military activity. Well, clearly you're on the fence about that, so we'll move on. <laughs> are you planning on running for re-election in 2018? And what do you say about rumors that Governor Rick Scott is gearing up to run against you? Uh, the short answer is yes. And uh, uh, the good Lord uh, willing, as you know, uh, every male in this room, by the way, will eventually have prostate cancer. And the good news is if you're checking it and you catch it early, uh, if it's all contained as when they remove the prostate, uh, and by the way, this was only six weeks ago, uh, that it was all contained. And so uh, I have the good fortune of being cancer free. And so the, <laughs> thank you. The good Lord uh, willing, uh, the short answer is yes. And with regard to whoever else it is that's gonna run, that'll take care of itself. And so I won't even comment on that. Can you update us on the progress of waiting lists and improvement of care at Veterans Administration facilities? I could uh, give you some entertainment by uh, mimicking someone who is presently in front of the TV saying, I love the veterans. It's a shame of what's happening to the veterans. It is a shame. There is something in the genetic makeup of the bureaucracy of the Veterans Administration that they can't get it. This is not to comment on the quality of medical care because most veterans who get the medical care will tell you they are entirely satisfied. It is the bungling process of administration that when a veteran needs to be seen, they need an immediate appointment. And that is what this fellow who used to be the head of Procter & Gamble has been brought in, Bob McDonald, as the Secretary of Veterans Affairs trying to change this culture. Now, this culture is so bad that Three or four years ago, as I'm going around in the midst of all this veterans hospital crisis, and I'm going to each of these hospitals, and I'm absolutely drilling the hospital administrator, and I look back, and what they told me was not true. They were covering up how these waiting lists became longer. So, about a year ago, uh, we passed a Veterans Reform Act trying to get to this. And one of the main reforms in it was to say that if a veteran didn't live within 50 miles of a hospital or if the veteran could not get an appointment within a certain period of time, that veteran had the right and the U.S. government would pay it to go into the private sector to the specialist doctor in the private sector. But that is being implemented now, and hopefully it's going to start to bear some fruit. Back to politics for a moment. Are you concerned with Secretary Clinton's email situation and the impact it might have on the Democratic chances to keep the White House? Uh, I am concerned because I don't think uh, her campaign has handled it well. But let me tell you something about national security classified information. I have handled a lot of it as the senior member of the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee and uh, formerly six years on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Number one, you don't send classified information on unclassified computers. Number two, when you send classified information, the very first sentence before it is all the indications of the classified 
uh, nature of that. So if it's top secret, it says TS. If it's that only an American citizen can see it, it's no foreign. If it's any deep category that limited people are compartmented to the information because of sensitivity, that's indicated on. And therefore, I believe that she is telling us the truth when she, Hillary, says that she did not get classified information. If she did, number one, it wasn't marked, and number two, it wasn't supposed to be coming on her computer anyway. So the fault with that, if it did, is being held with whoever sent it. Now, is it a wise thing that she ended up having a personal server uh, in her house. I think she clearly knows that now that that wasn't a wise thing. Uh, but in this era of this new kind of politics that I opened up with, where everything is subject to scrutiny and a cynical approach, is there something else lurking there? I certainly hope not. But if there is, we'll find out. Just a couple more questions. We are a notoriously bipartisan group at the Forum Club. What, what can Congress and the President accomplish before the end of this term? What can they get done? Um, and, and I want to conclude that last statement by telling you that I am a supporter of Hillary's. I am publicly out there for her. And Joe Biden was one of my best friends in the Senate. I think uh, Joe is going through uh, what would have been a lifelong dream of his, and he is making an evaluation. At the end of the day, and I have no inside knowledge, uh, I just as, as, uh, as long as Hillary has not uh, uh, fallen to all of this inquiry, and I think she will overcome this, uh, under those circumstances, I don't think Joe will get into the race. Now, your, uh, your question, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, your question is, what can the Congress accomplish? Well, we've got to pass uh, appropriations bills. And hopefully, we're going to be able, if we block the appropriations bills as we have thus far, because they have this sequester across the board cut, that will force more reasonable heads together and so that we can hammer out an appropriations bill and not have to do this kicking the can down the road uh, kind of activity with just continuing the past appropriations bills in what's called a continuing resolution. We've got to fund the highway bill some way. You can't keep going on like it is. We've got bridges that are not safe to be driving over. And I sit on the finance committee. That's the tax writing committee. I wish that we could get our colleagues there to do what I suggested earlier. But some way, we've got to come up, instead of all of this extraneous stuff, that they come up limping along to fund it for the next two months. You can't build highways that way. You've got to do contracts far in advance, and they've got to know that they've got the money coming. Uh, that's just two examples. And then, of course, uh, this uncertain world that we live in and the constant challenges to our military, our CIA, our DEA. I mean, you can go through all the alphabet, the Department of Homeland Security, and this is a major one, cyber security. We are getting pummeled every day. We could not get the U.S. Chamber of Commerce three years ago to pass what we had passed out of the Senate Intelligence Committee because they did not want any regulations on American business about reporting a cyber attack. So we now have a cyber bill 
ready to go onto the floor that it would be voluntary. It would go to a portal at Department of Health, Department of Homeland Security so that quickly we could find out because you get a cyber attack, say, on a Midwestern electric company that suddenly starts magnifying over time, you need that information quick so that you can respond to it as a national security issue. So I am very hopeful that we're going to be able to get a bipartisan agreement on a cybersecurity bill. Very good. Well, as you are a double-digit speaker here at the Forum Club, I'm sure you have enough paperweights in your office, so you are the first to receive a token of our gratitude, which is... Our, that was pretty good. Our official glass coffee mug. You're the first. Congratulations. <laughs> now, now I gave you that before the last question. So let's play which one of these is most likely. I'm going to give you a list. You tell me which one of these is most likely. Bill Nelson running for Senate in 2018. Joe Biden running for president 2016. Bill Nelson running for governor in 2018. Florida Gators winning the SEC East in 2015. All of the above. That's what we like to hear. 